My name is Ryan Rosenthal, joined as always by my co-host Andre. Uh, and today we are deeply honored to be joined by John Seifer. Uh, John spent 28 years in the CIA's National Clandestine Service, serving multiple overseas tours. He was chief of station, deputy chief of station in Europe and Asia. Uh, he was also lead instructor at the CIA's clandestine training school, so training future spies to be spies. Um, and since leaving the agency, John is co-founder of Spycraft Entertainment, which provides content to the entertainment industry. They've done a lot of interesting work, and we'll touch on that at the end of today's conversation. Uh, and then John is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Uh, and so, John, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really looking forward to today's conversation. I want to begin by talking about your CIA career. And, and uh, we've been very fortunate to have a lot of officers, former officers on the podcast. Each has their own unique story about kind of what drove them to join the agency. And so I'm curious, why did you do it? Why did you join the CIA? Yeah, interesting. So um, I grew up in a small town in upstate New York. My parents were teachers. And so I was always interested in history, politics, international affairs type of stuff, if you want. Um, and then I, I, you know, I studied history in college and I went off to graduate school and did international affairs. And, and uh, while I was doing that, I did an internship at State Department at, at INR, the Intelligence and Research Branch of, uh, of State, and to sort of get a, my sort of first taste of Washington and those kinds of things. And you know, as a young person coming out of graduate school, I was looking at a variety of options in Washington, uh, CIA among them. And, uh, and when I was in graduate school, I, I ended up applying to CIA and I, actually I applied to be an analyst. And so as you know, CIA has several sort of big tribes. It has you know, a science and technology tribe, but a big analytic cadre of people who mostly stay in Washington are experts on all sorts of things, military and political and economic, as well as it's overseas, the clandestine service, the sort of operational espionage side of the organization. So I came in actually to be an analyst thinking I would maybe work for a few years and then leave and go get a PhD or something like that. And um, actually when I went in, I ended up uh, you know, learning much more, learning about what the clandestine service did. Back then they were a little goosey when you were interviewing about actually telling you what the spy side of the house did. And so I was, I was a little hesitant to jump, jump in with both feet. But once I came in and was going through this sort of CIA 101 course, if you will, and, and learned about the thing, I became more interested in, in, in a career where I would, would go overseas. And luckily, I, when you come into the agency, you go through all this battery of tests and psychological tests and all kinds of craziness. And uh, you know, I guess my uh, sort of overview thing said I could work in, uh, in either side. And so I was able to switch over. So I never actually worked in the analytics side of the agency. Um, and so you know, all of a sudden, 30 years later, and you're getting ready to retire. So you know, you're, you're sort of going from one issue to the next, one place to the next, you know, sort of one challenge to the next. And it was a really rewarding and, and fun career. John, it's Andre here. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, you were chief of station several times, I believe. And I think many of our listeners have heard of the chief of station role. We've talked about it at times on the podcast, but I'm not sure too many of our listeners actually know what a chief of station does. So can you sort of tell us what that individual is in charge of, what they're responsible for? Sure. And there's, there's, there's all sorts of different versions of it, because in some places, you know, the CIA might only have one person in country, and that person's the chief of station, but they're the, a one-man show or one-woman show. And in other places, you know, the CIA, you can imagine in war zones and stuff has a large contingent of people, administrative, paramilitary, espionage, administrative people, and the chief of station is sort of in charge of, you know, managing and leading, you know, a much larger group. But in general, you think of the ambassador as the president's representative to a country in charge of all US government activity in a certain country. The chief of station is essentially the director of national intelligence you know, referent in, in a country. You're in charge of all intelligence related issues. And so, in a, and not just for the CIA, if the Defense Department or if the FBI is operating there or pe other people are doing some version of intelligence work, it's sort of under the auspices of, of the chief of station. So the chief of station's, you know, basic job is a sort of management and leadership job. It's to make sure your cadre of people are safe, fully functioning, focused on, on the issues they need to be focused on. You're, you're communicating and coordinating with Washington all of the, the issues and uh, activities that, that are taking place in, in that country. Uh, 
uh, you are maintaining that liaison with the ambassador to make sure that the ambassador is fully aware of what the intelligence community is up to in country and is not going to be surprised by things that might come up. So it's a, it's 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 essentially a management job, and and it you know it is making sure that you've structured your group to operate effectively, that you're keeping that that station running smoothly, that you're making sure the finances are are run tightly and you're doing good work for the taxpayers and and you're and you're collecting intelligence that is of use to policymakers. So John, you mentioned the re relationship with the ambassador and, and liaising and the ambassador is the, the chief US official in country um, wherever you're serving. And so does that relationship ever get a bit contentious? Because certainly the CIA and the IC, even DOD will be engaging in some activities that may make the job of an ambassador or any you know di diplomat in country very difficult no that, that's true and, and there's been cases of that obviously and so one of the jobs of the chief of station in fact maybe we you know one of the key jobs of the chief of station is to make sure that relationship is one you know sort of a, of clear communication even if there's sort of disagreements it's clear you know who has authorities for what what scope of activity is going on so yes it's true sometimes ambassadors come in fact a lot of ambassadors don't have international affairs experience. They, you know, a lot of our ambassadors are career foreign service officers at State Department and have been in embassies around the world. Sometimes presidents will, will put in ambassadors who, you know, might be academics or business people or, or you know, supporters of the, the president's campaign. And it's the job of the, the CIA uh, chief of state to educate that ambassador on what are the roles of the intelligence community, what are the things that are going on, uh, you know, how the interaction between state and commerce and DOD and, and, you know, FBI, if they're there, these type of things work. And so it's sort of a, it's a bit of a juggling act, um, but it, it's, it's one person you can't try to snow, you can't try to lie. If there's disagreements, they be, have to be dealt with head on. Uh, worse comes to worse. If there's disagreements that can't be solved locally, you have to go back to Washington to get senior people to, to weigh in if there's something. But but frankly, your job is to avoid that. Your job is to have that relationship, do the best you can to explain really clearly what you're doing and why and how it impacts or how it might not impact what the ambassador is trying to accomplish diplomatically. So this might be a dumb question, but also maybe a question you can answer in some aspects, perhaps you can't answer it in other aspects, but is the chief of station role, is it known to say foreign government officials? Do for, are foreign government officials aware there's a chief of station uh, at you know that embassy perhaps operating for the United States and so on, yeah. or is there a cover? So that's interesting. So that's it's not a dumb question. It's a very good question. I should have probably covered that. And so um, almost everywhere, the chief of station is what we call declared to the local government. Uh, in some places where our relationships with that government, we have an embassy, but it's, it's very poor. We might have a clandestine CIA station where there is no official relationship between the CIA and that and that country. But in most places, and in, in countries where you think that we don't get along, Russia, China, and other places like that, the, the chief of station is what's called declared, which means you come into country, you walk, you go over to the foreign ministry, you go over to their intelligence service, their police service, their military service, and say, I am the Central Intelligence Agency representative here. I want to work with you on areas of common interest and concern. Um, I'm going to share share information as, as, as makes sense between our two countries. Um, and, and so your job is, is, is a declared one, you are known. Now you are still under some version of what you say cover. So your, your neighbors and people on the street don't know you as the central intelligence representative. You don't want you know, criminals and terrorists and your neighbors and people knowing what you're doing, but the, the, the officials in that government do. And so it, you know, when you're a chief of station, I'll, I'll, you know, a large part of your job is that relationship also with the local service to, again, explain to them how you can actually be helpful to them and how they can actually be helpful to you. Um, and what's interesting, I don't think most people realize, but I would say a good 75% of the intelligence that the, that the Central Intelligence Agency produces every year for policymakers comes from those relationships. So oftentimes in countries, you don't think that we have very close relationships, there will be a tight intelligence relationship. So we might have a common interest in, you know, making sure you know, on China or on terrorism, and we can actually you know, help them because it, it serves our bigger interests and it serves their interests, even if we don't agree with them you know, across the board on all sorts of political issues. So that's a very good question. Thanks for asking.
It's a fascinating role because you have these intelligence uh, functions, but you also have essentially a, a diplomatic function working with both allied and adversary uh, security services and governments. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where you've served and I'm not going to ask where you've served, but I guess from your experiences with, you know, both yourself personally, but also colleagues, uh, is it harder to operate as the chief of station in, an, in a friendly country um, where they'll probably be requesting a lot more of you and try to balance that relationship? Or is it harder in an adversarial country when it's a, a contentious relationship? I mean, I can see both sides, but I'm just curious. Um, we tend to, is. agency people tend to want to go places where where contentious might not be the best word, but in places where there's, there's you know, important issues to be dealt with. You know, going to, to France or Germany or something, yes, we do a lot with them, where they're, but it becomes a little more official, diplomatic, bureaucratic, if you will. There's less, you know, the, it takes more time to convince them of things that, you know, the, so, so sometimes working in a place that is a little bit less so, that has more, you know, bigger regional issues, is a little more fun. I mean, and I've, I've heard it said when I came in the agency, and it's true, I think being chief of station overseas is like the best possible job you could have in the government. It's, it's sort of your own shop, you're working there, you're working with people. Yes, it, in some ways you're right, it's a good point. It's a diplomatic job in terms of working with the ambassador and working with the local services, but you're also managing espionage cases and intelligence cases uh, locally. Um, you know, you you really are sort of wading in that that local culture and issues and trying to help translate that to Washington to make it clear what kind of things you can do together and get away with. And so it's it's a it's great fun. So John, part of your career included service as a lead instructor, uh, where you train CIA officers. So when we talk about clandestine training. Is it similar to what we actually see portrayed in the TV shows and the movies that are, you know, all over the airwaves these days, or is it a bit different? What are the realities and the myths? Well, I don't know. I haven't watched. I know there's a couple of movies supposedly about sort of training at the, we call it the farm at our training facility. I haven't seen them, so I don't know exactly, but I can imagine it's, you know, if you're trying to put that in Hollywood fashion, it's, it's quite different. So, you know, it's very exercise driven. So, you know, uh, preparing to sort of train people in you know, espionage skills, tradecraft skills, and sort of the bureaucratic skills of, of how to write, how to write intelligence, how to write operational reports um, is, is very exercise driven. So it's sort of the crawl, walk, run thing. You come in there, you're with a large group, you, know, you might be given uh, a sort of a lecture on a, a variety of issues, and then you break up into smaller what you know home rooms or, or rooms with, with with several instructors and the instructors are usually people like me that you know worked several tours and then go to serve to two to four years at the farm training the next sort of cadre of people uh and so it's it, it's just sort of you know stories interactions here's my experience here's what you might do in this situation um as you can imagine our business is very dependent on situations and so there's a lot of you know, to questions from, you know, new students going to the farm, the answer is often, well, it depends. In this situation, you might look to do it this way, and this depends on this personality and what happens here. So it becomes sort of a running joke. And I think students oftentimes will like get t-shirts made up to say it depends, because that's always how you sort of start every answer at the farm. And so again, it's sort of a lecture, it's breaking into to rooms to sort of walk through training stuff, and then you put you into in a training scenario. So you'll actually go and practice surveillance detection with possible surveillance on the street, walking, driving. You'll then practice meeting a source. You'll practice debriefing a source for intelligence. You have to write that stuff up, turn it in, get feedback, um, and just goes on and on. So it's, a, it's sort of a longer process that takes usually a couple of years before people will be ready to go out to the field. So you go through the tradecraft training, then you go through a a training specific to where you might be going overseas. So if you're going to be going to North Africa, you might learn Arabic for a couple of years. You might do some special training in terms of if it's, if it's a dangerous place, you might have to learn how to handle a weapon. You might have to learn how to sort of protect yourself in dangerous situations and, and, the, and special vagaries of meeting potential terrorist sources as opposed to political sources. If you're going to a place like Russia or China, you have to have sort of a next level of, of uh, uh, surveillance training and how to avoid surveillance and operate under scrutiny and those type of things. And so, you know, training is sort of integral to everything we do and it continues through your career. Well, I'm glad you brought up Russia because that's going to be a big chunk of what we talk about today, considering your experiences in the Soviet Union and, and Russia. 
um, but also, you know, in agency and, and since um, you focus a lot of your time on, on this issue. And so I, I want to kind of, before we talk about the recent troop mobilizations and escalations by Russia, I, I want to ask you about your perspective on the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin in particular. And so from your point of view, what is it that Putin really wants? Is he this thug who just seized on an opportunity or is he very, you know, is he a tactician who is restoring Russian greatness? Is it both? Is it none? <laughs> well, um, you know, he's, he's sort of all of those things. And I, I do think he's sort of an excellent tactician, maybe a poor strategist. But it, it is, at his heart, he's essentially what I am, but a more Russian version of that. He's what we call a Czechist, you know, so the, the original uh, Soviet security intelligence service at the Bolshevik takeover was, was called the Cheka. And it was essentially the first thing the Bolshevik government did was create a security service, which was meant to sort of oppress any potential domestic opposition, but also to work up overseas to keep their sort of enemies at bay and off balance. And so the Cheka was, you know, all about keeping the leadership in power. And so intelligence officers to this day still call themselves Czechists. And as Czechist day is in December, it's coming up here in a couple of days, in fact. And Vladimir Putin always makes sure to be in Moscow to, to visit the security services on, on Czechist day. And so he grew up in the KGB. He always wanted to be a KGB officer. You know, he, he worked in sort of the domestic side of it, you know, look, going after potential political oppositionists and foreigners visiting Russia and then went, you know, overseas. But his version of overseas was in sort of Eastern Europe and in East Germany. And so, he, and then as the Soviet Union fell, you, you got to imagine the sort of the, how that can affect a person, a person who worked for the KGB, which saw itself as the sword and shield of the revolution. It saw itself as maybe the key institution in the Soviet state to have a state which was considered a superpower, one of the two most powerful superpowers in the world, fall apart and no longer exist. And to have gone through that mentally and, and deal with that is something that probably affected him very strongly. And in fact, in his own writings, he talks about when he was in Dresden, uh, he, they contacted the embassy. He worked in a consulate in Dresden. He contacted the embassy in, in Berlin asking for, for help when large groups of sort of demonstrators were coming around the consulate as, as the Eastern Bloc was falling apart. And he talked to the military attache in Berlin and said, hey, you know, we were looking for help. And the military attache said, we've contacted Moscow, but Moscow is silent. And to Putin, that sort of meant, hey, listen, when we needed the state, when we needed the brutality of the state, when we needed the power of the state, it wasn't there to protect us and we lost our state. So he went through that. He was in an organization that was in charge of security of the state and it, it, it was no longer. And so through the 1990s, he worked with a number of people and a number of sort of former KGB officers who still knew where the, the money was and still you know, were involved in smuggling networks and a lot of things that the KGB ran, uh, banking systems and things overseas for the KGB. And so th those people who, who had international experience and worked for the powerful KGB sort of maintained levers of power. And so by the time you know, Yeltsin stepped down and he came into power and eventually became president, um, he was very reliant on former Czechists, on other security service types to, to keep himself in power. I think in the early years, you know, he simply wanted to rebuild Russian strength to keep it, the economy strong, to sort of move forward. But over time, you know, he, he's, you know, his resentment sort of came out, his grievances against the West, this sort of Czechist past, it sort of took over. He made sure that he could control, you know, the economy and oligarchs who were sort of a political threat to him. He could control, you know, the lever of the media. He sort of stamped down on the media to the point where today, you know, he's been in power for 20 years, you know, and he's changed the constitution so he can stay in for another 20. And so you have a guy who's created a system, a corrupt crony type of system, which is meant to sort of keep him in power. And so the thing he fears is potentially losing control. And that's one of the reasons you see sort of him lashing out at neighbors and others. Um, you know, democratic success on his borders is a threat to him. He doesn't want his people getting in mind that, you know, they can they can go to the streets or they can vote him out of power. And he also has to keep those, those cronies around him, which he've made rich, sort of, you know, keep them in money and keep them sort of supporting the state because if they turn against them too, that that weakens his power. And so you got a guy who's 
who sort of created this crony kleptocrat the mafia don So in the U.S., what have we been getting wrong about Russia? So while I do agree that, you know, there is this crony corrupt system that Putin has sort of put in power in Russia, uh, and, you know, we've seen notable opposition in Russia, is it fair to say that Putin is still sort of fairly popular? Because I feel like from a class I took on Russia at, back in my undergrad days, uh, there was this propensity to sort of talk about Russians being in favor of strongman leaders such as Brezhnev, Putin, uh, and even back to the czars. So, I mean, is there some accuracy in saying that Putin is popular among the population? It's very tough because because it's hard to get you know accurate polling out of Russia because you you've created a state where there's not a lot of upside to criticize the government or cr criticize the Kremlin, and so you know there's a lot of people that are going to say that they're supportive when they when they may not be. But that said, is he does control the levers of the media what people see on television, what people see in printed form day after day is the Kremlin narrative, which in, in, you know, Putin has sort of created this thing that you need a strong man, Russia needs to be strong, it needs to keep its enemies at bay, that any sort of problems, economic problems are caused by the West, the United States, these other kind of things. And so it's natural that people will say, hey, you know, we have a president that's sort of keeping us strong, that's, that's keeping these enemies at bay. And so I think it's probably true that he has a level of popularity but he also has to constantly, you know, keep those levers moving to maintain both that popularity, but also sort of that power of control. He can't rely on, you know, an actual fair election for fear that, you know, those those things might change and he might lose power. Hold on a second. You make, I got to make this dog stop barking. Can you, you know, hold for just a second? Please. 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 I'm doing on the time. Sorry. All good. Yeah, there you go. Call it nice. So back to the question. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, he's popular, but he's popular in a system that he's built. Uh, to keep himself popular. But you've seen also in, in just in recent months and in the last year is he started to crack down more than even in the past couple of decades. And so any type of sort of free journalism or any type of groups that seem to have an interest that are, aren't con to totally controlled by the Kremlin, you know, they find themselves in jail or beaten by the police or these other kind of issues, you know, groups like Memorial and these other things that are just trying to, to you know, even look at put history in, in the right form are seen as a threat to the Kremlin. So I think in the early days, he had enough popularity and, you know, had created the system where Russia was slowly improving and the economy was improving that he could, he could maintain control, keep his cronies happy, but also keep a sort of a level of normality. But that seems to be changing recently. And you can argue that some of the things we're seeing in Ukraine and other kinds of things are just ways of keeping the population uh, thinking, hey, there's uh, there's external threats and we need Putin to, to protect us against them. I mean, there's a lot of important things that you just mentioned. Uh, for those of you interested uh, in kind of learning more about polling in Russia, Levada Center is a great resource. I recommend you all check it out, levada.ru. Um, but but John, I mean, for me, I think the one of the greatest challenges in understanding Russia, and I think for people who may not be familiar with it, just don't see it as, you know, it's, it's not a top down, like Putin has all the power. You mentioned all these all these institutions he has to balance from the security services to civil society to I mean all the kind of parties that are in place. Um, and so with that, we've seen this huge crackdown on civil society, particularly the attempt at Alexei Navalny's, Alexei Navalny's life. Uh, he's imprisoned. Um, is there any way in which civil society in Russia can maintain a continued pushback against the government, given the you know, foreign agent laws and the arrests and arbitrary killings. Uh, what can the international community do and what can Russian civil society do to, to push back? Yeah, well, not a lot. Um, it, it is indeed true that he hasn't created a sort of a Stalinist system, a classic dictator that controls everything and, and needs to. It's, it's more sort of a, of a balancing act. He has to keep 
his cronies who he keeps rich and sort of these warring clans around the top. He has to keep them happy. He has to have some version of, of you know, popularity amongst the people and give them a sense that, you know, he's moving the country in the right way, that he's helping to keep them safe, that, that you know, the economy is sort of better over time. And so there's sort of this constant balancing act. But what happens when anything that threatens that, he has this, this sort of clamp down. And, and increasingly over recent years, that, that clamp down part is getting tougher and tougher. You know, you can make a good example with Navalny. So you have a guy here who had was sort of a opposition political figure, if you will. He was going to run for mayor. But of course, they, they didn't allow him to run for mayor. But he was doing these sort of YouTube, you know, anti-Kremlin sort of YouTube channel shows and was sort of big on social media. But he really didn't have political power. He, you know, he had some sort of following among young people. And, um, but he still, you know, to the Kremlin's way of thinking, he was a potential threat, even though, you know, if you looked at it sensibly, he wasn't a real threat. But so much so that they were actually willing to murder him. So they sent, you know, you know, KGB military thugs around to follow him around and, and poison him, you know, hoping he would die. He didn't die. He was saved by you know, flowing at the last minute to Germany where he was in a hospital and, and saved. And then, you know, he went back to Russia. And when he went back to Russia, he was immediately jailed. So in some ways, he's become a symbol, an anti-Kremlin symbol for you know, those in, in Russia who might want an, something new and different. And so in some ways, his crackdown has actually created bigger problems for him. And you can make the same argument with Ukraine. Ukraine was a country that was sort of in between the East and the West. You know, it had sort of pro-Russian elements, but it had pro-Western elements. And as his sort of chief, his uh, president that was put in power there in Ukraine um, was starting to, to lose control and perhaps lose an election, he, he clamped down, he sent troops and took over Crimea and the Donbass and Eastern Ukraine. And so in a sense, he's created a Ukraine who now sees Russia as an enemy and is much even more inclined to, to want to move towards the West or look for you know, defense and help from, from the West. And so you know, rather than sort of use uh, the tools of, of uh, you know, working with other countries of trying to show a positive benefit to working with Russia and with the Kremlin, He's actually sort of created problems with Navalny, with Ukraine, with these other things, because that's sort of, the, again, that's the, that's the Czechist instinct. It was George Kennan who said, you know, any neighbor of Russia either has to be, you know, essentially a, an a enemy or a vassal. And if you're, if you're not one, you're the other. And, and you know, so he's essentially, try, he's essentially trying to say that Ukraine needs to be in the Russian camp and needs to be a, a vassal of the Kremlin. So let's talk a bit more about the Ukraine. So what do you make of Russia's recent troop buildup on Ukraine's borders? Uh, we've seen many analysts agree and disagree about whether Russia is actually going to invade. So are they, do you think they're actually going to invade or are they just posturing for security guarantees or is it something else? Uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. And if I, <laughs> if I did, I would call the White House and tell them I know the answer to it. And so that's why there's some concern. And, and frankly, I don't know if Putin knows the answer to it yet. You know, this is sort of, we've seen a pattern of this, you know, through his whole presidency is sort of pushing boundaries and then seeing what, what happens and seeing how far he can go. And so, you know, there's, there's a pattern here of Russia creating a problem of being, of taking an international action that creates a problem and then essentially asking for concessions from the West to solve that problem. And so um, he's, in the spring, he moved troops up to the Ukrainian border. Uh, there was a lot of interest from the West and the United Nations, from NATO and the EU and, and, and the White House. And essentially, President Biden said, hey, let's meet in, in, in person, talk this through, you know, see what we can try to tamp down uh, potential you know, threats here. And they, and they moved back from the border. So then, you know, fast forward six months, we have a larger group of people coming to the border. Um, and you can argue, okay, this this is just a game to try to get concessions in the West. Every time we want to, we don't think we're getting enough respect, or people aren't paying enough attention. We can we can ramp this up, get them to some come running to us, and then you know hopefully even get concessions from them. You know, the, you can imagine the West saying, "Oh my goodness, we're worried about a war. It could spiral out of control." You know, Putin just wants you know some some promises and some different things. Let's let's give them to him. And so he's essentially 
you know, we call it escalate to de-escalate. He escalates the situation, hoping, asking for people to pay attention, give him some concessions to, for him to de-escalate. So he creates a problem that he can then act like he's solved the problem. And so what we don't know with Ukraine is, you know, he also does believe some of these things. You know, he did already go into Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. It's not, it's not something that just, you know, is just a threat. So, you know, he said publicly he doesn't see Ukraine as a country. He sees it as part of Russia. And so I think, you know, I think he does believe those things, but he has to calculate, is it worth it for him to fully invade, you know, and have, you know, Russian soldiers coming back in body bags, or is it, or and make himself a potential pariah state in, in Europe and things more than he already is, and maybe damage his economy. So there's a variety of things that could happen. He can be pushed here and hope for you know, the kind of concessions that he's done in the past. He could truly invade because, you know, it's, it's, he's finally decided now is the time. He's never going to be able to do it again. Or, you know, even more possible, he might take some action that, that forces our hand. So, you know, like he did before, he goes into the Donbass. He might say, okay, the Donbass, you know, has not gone well for, for Russian troops and Russian supported groups there. You know, he's, he's claiming that, you know, Ukraine and Nazis are, are doing things there and it's a threat to Russia. He could easily just send troops in there to, to that one small area of Eastern Ukraine to sort of to maintain order. And then what does the West do? I mean, that's, it isn't as if we're going to, we or the West or NATO are going to fight to try to keep them out from that small slice of territory. But then again, he, so now he's gained that a piece of Ukraine. He's destabilized Ukraine. He's made it difficult, more difficult for them to work with the West. And he's and he's he's taken an action where it's, where it's quite quite brutal and uh, aggressive, but he's made it very difficult for the West to respond. And so there's a variety of things from you know a full invasion to a backing down, and it you know and I don't know that he's made that decision yet. I mean I, I certainly agree with you. It's something that Andre and I have talked about on the podcast before. Um, in addition, we've also talked about the response in the U.S., particularly from media, which has been quite frustrating uh, for me uh, in particular, given that some remnants of the media, particularly on the right, have echoed Russian propaganda and misinformation about Russia's interests regarding Ukraine. And so, John, could you please tell our listeners first why Ukraine security is important for the U.S. and help us understand the Kremlin's information operations? Wow, there's, that's a, there's a lot there. And so... You know, when I talked about Russia being a Czechist power, you know, I'm talking about their security services and how the security service is used by the state. So in Russia, the security service, the KGB, that now it's the FSB, the SVR, are essentially, you know, really important tools that Putin uses because he understands them and he, and he uses them to create sort of subversion overseas and essentially uses them domestically to keep opposition at bay too. And so uh, he relies on, on sort of those services you know, Western intelligence service, okay, I say I work for the CIA clandestine service, you know, 90% of, of what the CIA does is it collects intelligence information, which then goes to professional analytic cadre who takes CIA collection information from, from human sources, puts it together with information from academics and business people and satellites and military attaches and diplomats, put all that together on each issue to inform policymakers, hopefully to make better policy. So it's an intelligence collection and analysis operation. And most Western security services, intelligence services are just that. The Russian intelligence service, since the, since the beginning, since the early days, you know, and the Cheka, were more 75 to 80% this active measures, this covert action, this um, creating sabotage, subversion, you know, liquidating enemies, assassinations, um, disinformation, all these sort of type of things to keep sort of enemies weak. And it, it started when the, when the Bolshevik state was actually quite weak, that they would, they would try to weaken their enemies from, from within because they couldn't take them on head on. It was almost like a terrorist group. A terrorist group can't take on, you know, the U.S. Army head on, but it can look for weaknesses and take advantage of those weaknesses. And that has become sort of the culture of the, the, the Russian security services. And it is still to this day. We saw in 2016 messing with our elections, spreading disinformation, weaponizing social media, all these other kind of things. And so why is Ukraine important? Probably, you know, aside from just Ukraine, the things we've been talking about, if you continue to give in to these activities where Russia creates a, creates a threat and then asks for, for concessions to solve the threat that they created, the more you continue to play that game, the further and further on he, he pushes. And so, you know, it's sort of in our interest at some point 
to push back and, and, and stop that. You know, Russia is really, a, at this stage, is sort of a revisionist power. Um, you know, they are losing the 21st century. You can argue that the Chinese are winning the 21st century. They're not, the Chinese aren't looking to sort of, to, to disrupt and cause trouble in the international system because they rely on the international system. They, they want to own it and be rich and take advantage of the system that the West created of free trade and these other type of things. Whereas Russia, because it's losing, it needs essentially in their interest just to sort of cause havoc, to create chaos, create problems between the Europe and the United States and between European countries. And so they're looking to subvert the international order. And so what's happening in places like Ukraine and others is part of that process of sort of power politics, old fashioned 19th century sphere of influence. You know, you know, you need to be under our control. And those are the kind of things using military force to interfere. Those are the kind of things that, you know, in this day and age, we can't really give into. If you give in and say, oh, sure, OK, Ukraine, you know, it's it's a democratic sovereign state. But sure, that really is your democratic. It's now your state to control. Um, you know, where does that end? Is that the way, you know, what does that make the West look like if we're going to willing to play those sort of really brutal old fashioned 19th century games? You know, how do, how do we then respond with China and Taiwan? And how do we, you know, deal with European allies, you know, if, we're, if we give into that type of thing? So, you know, it, it's important to, to support other democratic countries. It's a country in Europe. You know, we have European allies who are incredibly, and NATO allies who are incredibly close to Ukraine. The health of Ukraine is important to them. But in that sort of bigger sense, is you know, we can't be seen to sort of be subverting the international order that we depend on and we've sort of created. So, how can the US actually help Ukraine in warding off potential Russian offensive? I mean, aside from troop commitments in Ukraine, what would actually raise the costs for Russia? Would economic sanctions actually do it? Yeah, I mean, I think part of the problem is we haven't reacted strongly in the past. You know, when they took over Crimea, there was very little cost to be paid to, to Putin. You know, and when they've gone into the Donbass with their little green men, there's been real little cost, there's been some economic sanctions. Um, and the problem is, they, like I said, they, they've, they've benefited from sort of being willing to be more aggressive and take sort of actions that, that others wouldn't take and then have us just, you know, hope that it would sort of go away. And so it, it, he, Putin has played on the fact that if he's not getting attention, he can sort of rattle the, the cages and get everybody to sort of pay attention for a little while, you know, give in to him on the hopes that things will get better. You saw under the Obama administration, even the Bush administration before that, you know, maybe we should do a reset. Maybe it's our fault. Maybe we should try to, you know, just work with, with Putin and Russia on a variety of issues. You know, we've seen time and time again that every time we've tried that, he's had no interest in that. And I think, you know, after 20 years of him being in power, we understand he's not going to change. He sees himself in a form of sort of political warfare against the West. Anything that weakens United States that weakens Western countries and, and the relationship between those Western countries is in his interest. And so when a country says they're at war with you, rather than try to continue to appease them and to say yes and be friendly and where, where can we work together? At this point, I think we just need to say, okay, this is what Vladimir Putin is. We have to understand what our issues are and where our red lines are and, and be very strong on those kind of things. So what kind of things can, can uh, you know, maybe save us from, from an invasion of Ukraine? It's not just military things at this point. It's it's creating an impression in his head that we've we've had enough. Like I mentioned before, these things that they've done over the years, this asymmetric warfare is the warfare of the weak against the strong. It's like terrorists. It's you know going after soft spots, looking for weaknesses, taking advantage of them. Russia's been really really good at that because they have a, a large intelligence service. They understand the West. They understand how far they can push before we push back, and. You know, they pushed and they pushed and we have not essentially pushed back. And he understands, I think, if he pushes too far, you know, he's got a country with an economy the size of Portugal's. If the West, the United States, NATO, the EU truly see Russia as enemy and decide to put its forces and push back against Russia, he then is at a disadvantage that he can't control. And so I think he's very careful about pushing and pushing and trying to find a place where he where he pushes and gets his way, but without pushing too far. And so I think the answer is to make it clear to him that we've now think you've gone too far and we're willing to put those resources behind pushing back, which would mean treating Russia like a rogue state, which would mean like 
cutting off their use of Western banking and legal services, which would mean not allowing Russian uh, cultural and sporting teams and things to come to the West. It would mean about cutting them off of international banking, uh, you know, uh, services. It would it would it would mean you know increasing uh, support to NATO and military issues. It, it would it would it would, might include saying, okay, you know, your biggest fear seems to be NATO having places like Georgia and Ukraine join. Well, we'll you know. You're the one that's making that possible. The, you know, there's been no real discussion of that happening, but those countries now we think that their their ability to stay as sovereign countries depend upon that, and so we will now start to consider those kind of things. And so, you know, threatening Putin's money and his control are things that he has to see that you know he's he's gone too far, and therefore he needs to pull back. And so, you know, I think we should have been doing it for a long time. We're in a weaker position now because we haven't done it. But we have to start considering those kind of things that cause real, real pain to Putin and his ability to maintain power. So I, I think for the immediate future, or certainly for as long as Vladimir Putin's in power, relations may not improve substantially. Um, and is that, I mean, really the case? Do we need a post-Putin Russia in order for a, a meaningful reset or something that would possibly lead to greater areas of cooperation? Is it, is it I guess, essentially impossible for the US, or I guess even the West and Russia uh, to have a, a stable relationship as long as Putin's in power? I think so, and I think that's unfortunate. I think, you know, Russian people would like to have, you know, I live there, I work there. Uh, you know, there's the term you often hear from Russians is we just want to be a normal country, you know, a lot of sort of Russians. And, and, and you know, the, there's no people that has been worse served by leaders over the last 200 years than the Russian people. They've had, you know, incredibly brutal leaders, czars and others that, saw them as fodder and, and is sort of support. And, and so it's unfortunate for, the, for the, the Russian people. I think Putin has made it clear that he doesn't want better relations. You know, you say better, better relations is important. Sure it is, but it takes two to tango. And if one side has no interest, then I think what you do is you just have to create a, a sort of a system of, of deterrence and, and sort of where, you know, where the red lines are and, you know, cooperate where you need to cooperate and there are there you know we do cooperate with them you know like i said even the cia works with the security services in russia there are issues related to terrorism and iran and and instability on their borders that we we share information with them we help them on on things and you know they sometimes share information with us it's not as robust and good as it should be and you know our diplomats continue to talk to their diplomats our president talks to them on on a variety of issues arms control and other things um, but yeah, that relationship in a perfect world would be much more robust. It would be much better. We'd be talking about things to try to improve, you know, Russian economic situation, improve cooperation, trade, those kind of things. But they don't want that. They see us as an enemy and they continue to attack us and subvert us. And, and so I don't think Vladimir Putin is going to change. And so maybe, you know, when he leaves, you know, that we'll, we'll see what happens. But what unfortunately has happened is you know, he's created a system where it's not, a, there's not a clear way that power changes hands now. And so there's a chance that that could be smooth and, and, you know, democratic, if you will, but it also could be quite nasty and brutal. So John, since leaving government, you co-founded a production company that takes the ideas of former Intel professionals into a variety of different media formats. So how receptive has Hollywood been to former career professionals such as yourself? What's it like to actually translate these real life experiences into entertainment? <laughs> well, it's been, it's been really fun. So listen, I love working in CIA. I love living overseas. I loved you know, learning new cultures and languages and, and working on the issues of the day and, you know, what's important and, and with partners around the world. I, I have no regrets whatsoever. It was a lot of fun. I, le I left at a time where, I, you know, I was still enjoying it. And uh, I did some consulting work and I did some sort of writing and other things, but I eventually got involved sort of with this or sort of a weird way of doing things, you know, talking to some of our friends is oftentimes we sit around with, with people who, you know, retirees or those of us in the CIA, and we start telling stories of sort of farce and screw up and, you know, funny things that have happened. And oftentimes you'd be sitting with some people and they'll be, they'll be with you and they're like, wow, those are like the most fascinating things I've, I've ever heard. And we, we said, listen, we should think about, you know, translating some of that to Hollywood. Now, Hollywood has benefited over the years of having, you know, onesies and twosies of people from the intelligence community or CIA work with them as consultants on stories. 
Sometimes they've been people who actually were, you know, yes, they worked, they might have worked for CIA, but they were, you know, sort of failed officers or they, you know, problems, but, you know, Hollywood didn't know. And our thought was, is to try to take a, a number of sort of senior officers with a, a variety of stories, try to work with Hollywood writers and producers to be, to build content, to tell stories, both our own stories, optioning books, optioning, you know, articles and stories and podcasts that might be made into movies, streaming series, or television network shows from the beginning and work with the writers to be sort of in it from the beginning to the end, um, as opposed to just sort of showing up and, and helping, you know, them understand what does the office look like and what color badge do you wear and that in those type of things. That's in the Hollywood sort of hierarchy of, of things. Those are consultants that are brought in at the last minute to try to make, you know, if they're doing a military movie, make sure they hold the guns right and, you know, put on the put on their equipment properly. What we want to do is sort of get inside, get in sort of the creativity side on the content side and, and work with writers as they build shows and, and movies. And it's been, it's been a lot, it's been a lot of fun. And, you know, it, it's fun to do something different, to work with creative people um, and sort of help translate our world, you know, to them and, 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 and build st stories that are both entertaining, but also sort of realistic. I'm curious what are like the gaps in TV and movies from real life? Because I imagine there are, are certain things that may not translate well into film because a lot of a CIA officer's job yeah. is mundane and boring, boring writing, right? Yeah, because you're you're trying to, you know, get around surveillance and that can be boring when it's done for two and a half <laughs> hours and that's an entire movie. Yeah, that is indeed true. And and so, you know, what we're doing, there, there's, there's, it's interesting because there's a, there's a, there's a, a long history of, material books, cases, espionage cases over the years that haven't been made into television shows. And, and you can think even in the last year of, of movies that have come out, there's the movie on Penkovsky, The Courier, there's The Bridge of Spies, there's a variety of things that have come out. Those, show, that, those cases, that information has been known for 70, 60, 70 years and has never been translated into a movie. There's countless stories, books that are out of print, espionage cases, you know, and things that that uh, have come up that can be used as sort of the basis to create shows. And, you know, one of the things that first happened is we went out there and we'd start to meet with writers and producers and things is we would tell these sort of stories like we were CIA officers briefing people. You know, we were focused on, you know, impact and, you know, the farcicalness of the story and sort of all content. And early on, we'd, we'd talk to them and they would sort of look at us like, well, who did it? And you're like, what do you mean who did it? Like, this is what happened. And then we sort of started to realize, you know, Hollywood tells story through characters, right? Character first. You have to have an interesting character or a group of characters that then, you know, the story sort of builds behind the character development and character arc. And so, you know, we've started to lear learn and move that way. And so we're, we're trying to find interesting and new places to put a variety of characters that, you know, don't even, the espionage story doesn't necessarily need to be the, the, the A story. It can sort of be behind, you know, you look at the Sopranos as a, is essentially a family story, but they happen to be in the mafia, right? And so, you know, it's not the mafia story that takes center stage, it's the family story. And so we're looking for a variety of, of ways of telling stories that it doesn't have to be, you know, spy stuff in your face all the time, but the spy world can be sort of, you know, animating it. So John, are there any projects in the works uh, that you'd be willing to preview for our listeners? <laughs> well, one thing we've learned is Hollywood is incredibly slow. And Hollywood is also going through quite a sort of a, a real change in the way they've done things. So the whole sort of history of how movies are put together and, and you know, back ends and things have been upended during COVID because movie theaters are going out. Streaming services are becoming much more prevalent. These sort of longer series instead of telling, you know, two hour sh shows like, you know, there's few and fewer movies made, more and more streaming shows made. Network TV is sort of continues along at sort of at its pace. And so a lot of those, those shows aren't as interesting, but they, they reach more eyeballs. So we're doing a variety of different things. It just takes a long time. And so, you know, we'll work with a writer, we'll build an idea, we'll build a show, we'll pitch that idea to a production company who might have relationships with buyers, with the Netflix, Hulu's, Amazon's, you know, Sony's, Paramount's of the world. And then work with them, write, write a script, and then pull together writers rooms and start that process. So there's a number of things we've done. You know, we've actually signed things. We're working with, with Apple and Netflix and, and ABC and a number of other shows, but nothing has actually been filmed yet 
and you don't, don't get paid until the, until it goes to a distributor on the on the other end. And so we have a couple of movies coming out or coming out, which we hope to be coming out. You know, great stuff often ends up for some reason in Hollywood failing, and some things end up sort of coming through. So we have a couple of movies related to you know the sort of battle against ISIS in in Iraq. We have a with Apple like a kids show, it's, which is about you know CIA officers moving back to the United States and the officers having to, to tell their children what they do for a living. We call it making them witting, you know, telling their young, you know, eighth grader that, you know, mommy or daddy actually works for the CIA. And CIA actually has a family day where you bring your kids to work. And so a lot of people will use that to bring their children in to say, okay, listen, you know, you, you think we've been, you know, we claim we've been working in the embassy as com commercial officers or State Department officers. Actually, we work for the CIA and I need to talk to you about what that means and what that means in terms of protecting I cover and those type of things. So we have a story about, you know, essentially of these kids, this group of kids learning what their parents do. And they're in this school, they've come from overseas. And then now they realize their buddies, you know, are all sort of of the, of the sort of same ilk and they've been overseas. And then they sort of like Goonies like stuff, they get involved in their own little cases. And we're actually working with a, um, with a uh, sci-fi person about sort of a, who's, who's had real success on sort of these, uh, you know, alien type of thing saying, okay, let me put a thing to you. What if, you know, there was an alien landing in the, in the in somewhere in the world and they actually came to the CIA and said, we need you to investigate this and do this. Just put, put aside the reality of that. What, what would happen? How would the government work? Who would talk to who, who would be in charge? What could be told, not told, you know, what, what things could, could the agency use and not use? How would they work with foreign, you know, adversaries or, 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 um, colleagues and things and so we're you know we have one like like that we have a show that takes place in Iceland which is essentially a, which is a a place that there's actually nothing to steal and so the CIA operating there you know the sort of the conceit is you know CIA has to have some place to put its people who aren't really very good and <laughs> sticking them in Iceland is a good place they can't cause too much trouble there's not much to steal you know it's not like the president's going to get a call from you know an officer doing something stupid and in Iceland, so we have sort of a story of a sort of a doofus CIA guy and a doofus um, uh, KGB woman who happens to be there, and you know they're sort of being set aside. But of course, as you can imagine, then things actually do happen, and sort of this sort of B team, B team of losers have to sort of solve the problem. And um, so yeah, a whole variety of that. We have some you know some things we've got set up in in Africa. We're working with some foreign. Um, producers and, and directors because you know nowadays you watch on these streaming services you know some of the foreign stuff is is great in fact you know probably one of the best espionage shows that i'm aware of is the french one the bureau i don't know if you've watched the bureau but it has a much better feel of what goes on in day-to-day -day espionage than you know most of the american films and series that i've seen well it all sounds so very interesting and i look forward to when all these things come out particularly the iceland one because that just seems like a fantastic <laughs> idea um, John, I want to ask you one more question before we wrap today's conversation. Uh, given you were a, a CIA officer for your career and you still pay attention to a lot of issues today, what are some things, some major threats that we're not really paying attention to uh, in today's world? Well, to turn it back to Russia, for example, one of the advantages that Russia has had, like I said, it is sort of in some ways a second rate power and economically, you know, less than that, but they've caused tremendous pain for us. And, you know, one of the advantages that Putin has is all of his institutions, you know, if you're a criminal in Russia, or if you work for the foreign ministry, or if you work for the intelligence service or the military, or you're a cyber hacker, you all, you know that you have one main enemy and that's the United States. And so anything you can do, you know, in your sphere to damage the United States is something that the Kremlin is going to be supportive of. So in some ways, all these people can be like aiming in the same direction, and then the Kremlin can say, "Oh, look at this! These hackers are having success here, and and you know these cyber actors are having success there, and this disinformation campaign is having success there, and they can sort of put it together as a campaign against the United States and the West." The United States has a whole separate variety of issues that it pays attention to, and that's part of, you know, it's a strength because we're a much larger, you know, and richer country, and have worldwide responsibilities. But we don't just have one place to focus. All of our institutions aren't aiming in the same direction. We're dealing with international terrorism. We're dealing with uh, 
you know, rogue countries like North Korea and Iran. We're dealing with, you know, NATO countries that are having problems like Turkey that are sort of, you know, changing the way they do things. Autocratic regimes. We're dealing with problems in in Latin America, and in Africa. You know, we, you know, an incredibly powerful and growing China, Russia. All of these things. You know, we can keep aiming that the United States is having to focus on, so that in some ways that's where Russia benefits is is they continue to whack at us, hit boom, boom, boom chip away at the stone, whereas we sort of pay attention to them and then hope that that solved it and that's going to go away and we can go focus over here or deal with terrorism or these other issues. And so part of the problem is the United States is so focused in so many different places. I think the administration wants the world to sort of settle down so they can focus on China as a sort of a long-term growing uh, challenge and threat, but the world doesn't work that way. You know, events happen, things change, terrorism could, you know, could, could grow again. Issues in the Middle East, we say we want to sort of get out of the Middle East, but of course, you know, problems and issues can happen there between, say, Israel and Iran or other kind of things, then we find ourselves back in the middle of those things. And so we have to be prepared for, for problems and, and issues sort of around the world. And so I can remember things that we would never have thought, you know, as I was coming through that, you know, issues in, in Kosovo would become a problem for the United States or in you know, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, no one was paying attention to Afghanistan at all. We didn't even have an embassy there. And all of a sudden they became, you know, a 20 year problem and war for us. And so we need to maintain that worldwide presence and focus on all of these kind of things. Some of the issues I mentioned, you know, you know, whether Turkey, I mean, Turkey plays a role between sort of Russia and the West and, and sort of the Middle East world. It's part of NATO, but it's sort of bristling at, you know, Western and European and the United States. Um, interference or whatever they want to call it. Um, you got issues related to sort of, you know, countries that could be filled, countries like Nigeria with massive wealth and, and oil in, in, in Africa. Um, yeah, so there's just, there's just such a variety of things and we just can't really drop the ball on any of them. And that's our, it's great that we have that role in the world, but it, it, it's, a, it's a unique challenge. And so you can't just sort of focus one place because what will happen is it pops up somewhere else. On that note, John, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate the conversation. For our listeners, you can follow John at John underscore Cypher on Twitter, where he is very active. I love reading your tweets. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> Who knew that being snarky would have a following? So, Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much. My pleasure. It's great talking to you guys.